So this first poem, um, just a little introduction. Uh, there's some um, religious, spiritual, and psychological traditions that talk about lucid dreaming. And um, it's a way of awakening in dreams. And um, the first thing that some practitioners suggest that you do is find your hands in a dream. Edgar Cayce um, was one of those people. Lucid dream. I find my hands and walk among the dead, ignore my father, my mother, look for Ed, Casey follower who died yellow in a bed. They all are realized beings, never realized in life. I won't leave this place unanswered. My only question, why justice is unfulfilled. The dead do not speak, not even hear. So of course, there's always a blockbuster movie. The title of this poem, another blockbuster from the Marvel Universe. Comical, ascribing extraordinary powers to heroes and heroine in our time of greatest need. We are on the cusp of disaster they're one famine away from tearing each other apart for the last morsel. I wouldn't know a goddess if she slapped me on the ass, let alone gave birth to a messiah. Gautama gave us the best direction. Be still and breathe. Lest we forget, he did abandon wife and son. Shit. Any one of us could sit and meditate after dropping out like that. At least he didn't set fire to his car after locking his family in it. My hero is my mother. She rescued my father from abandonment as a child and gave birth to 12 kids of her own. He slapped her around, then quit drinking, held her hand, the rest of their lives in penitential submission, and he lost just one day of work during the Great Depression. Those lunatics swallowing moonshine, howling when Diana reveals herself fully for a night. What do they know about tides? When the moon is on the other side of the world, pulling sailors, anyone not anchored to their depths, that's some superpower staying put. This poem begins with um, <clears throat> an epigraph. Here and here again, but do not understand. See and see again, but do not perceive. Isaiah 610. Bliss. This, this is bliss, this blistering from the light, this history again and again repeating. If I must hold a mirror to my face all my life, changing before those eyes looking back, who is he, who are they that lie, look only out, dare call it sight. I hear and hear again, but do not understand. Fool, no man is God, nor woman. No one speaks the speech of God. I see and see again, light, exploding missiles, stars, distance, the only difference. They are among us, these creatures without soul. Those of us who hear and hear again, who see and know, we do not see through mystery's veil, the thread of light to reveal what we already know. We will never understand and never see that face. So um, 
Jed and I and some other poets who are uh, actually here tonight um, study with um, a great poet and teacher, uh, Leonard Gunterek, and he suggested one time um, a, um, a prompt which was um, write a commencement address as if you were asked to give it at a university. So here is my response to that. And um, in this poem, I make reference to something, a Latin phrase, limbus infantium, which is Latin for children's limbo, um, abode of those who have died without actual sin, but whose original sin has not been washed away by baptism. Commencement address. It would be temptation itself to trivialize this day, give credit where no credit is due, to contextualize the circumstances of your births, your imprisonment, for let us not mince words of this, your confinement without recourse or redress. There is no other word that would not in its minimization be not only inaccurate, but a lie with myth or the mythology of history to assuage the guilty conscience of elders, those, shall we say, in charge would not suffice. Have I failed to mention the title of the poem? Dante Alighieri delivers the commencement address to the first and last graduating class from Limbus Infantium. Still, we have arrived at this glorious day, a day to use the vernacular, which will be a one-off, one of a kind, the bomb. We note the father is absent, as is the son. Always courageously in their place, we have the spirit. I see from the clever way some of you chose to decorate your mortal boards here, pause for anticipated titters, not long, your humor is an acquired taste. That some are hellbound, some heaven sent, ha. Okay, settle down, we are almost done. Allow me to say in closing, look around you, make note of who is not here among you. Seek them in the darkness of days ahead. Bring them along. This will be what is required of you in the time to come. Do not be content with your release, but strive for the release of others. Godspeed, whatever that means. So of course, as um, Jen's introduction alluded to um, a lot of these poems were written this last year. Title here is December 2020. My wife and the ghost of my mother insist I must love my neighbor who refuses to remove his candidate sign prominently displayed on his lawn. It's December. I've always found it hard to be mature. I'm a conventionally sculpted Popeye. She's olive in an hourglass oil jar. Lovely. It's Christmas without presents and Eve Arden New Year without alcohol. My mother knew how to have fun. She ignored everyone, especially her responsibilities. She left the planet as a little girl only came back to apologize without so much as clearing her throat for telling me, I wish you were never born. I haven't a clue why she's appeared now. It must be that exchange with my son in the car when he discovers Clapton's tears in heaven is about his son's sudden death. We rode in silence after that listening to the beautiful song. I'm never silent for long. By the time we get home, I learn that Eric is 
singing Van Morrison's latest tune, condemning the lockdowns and science's silence about the poor, isolated musicians. Just another voice clamoring to be heeded, whose breath convinces him he's alive, immune, hasn't had to look into his mother's eyes, dying on the other side of the glass. Um, <clears throat> the title of this poem is actually a quote from the poet Tadeusz Tabrowski from his poem, It's Not True That the World is an Unending Return. For you want to be heaven yourself. I have 42 pairs of shoes. Many, no longer my style, never leave the box. A quarter of them are sneakers. I date myself. I came home from Thailand where I was stationed in the army with a new wardrobe that included candy apple red Balmorals and a pair of blue and gray brogue ankle boots I wore at my first wedding with a baby blue blouse, white bell bottoms, and a silk matching reversible vest. I have two pairs of cowboy boots, red and black from Nashville, worn only at Christmas. The other, a pair of Zodiacs, woody cobra and black. I inherited my love of wingtips from an older generation. I have a green pair and ones where the tip holes are hammered into black zip up ankle boots hiding a red interior sole. There are the red black faux lizard Oxfords with the pointy roach killer toes. Believe it or not, I'm still in my blue period. And um, I guess later on there'll be a poem about all my blue shoes. <laughs> hole in the sky. We think our thoughts in metaphor speak in pictures of our worlds. Even the language of landscape will paint a hole in the sky. A prisoner can illustrate the way to endure. Stop pulling the chain. Mathematicians emerging from hallucination can only draw conclusions. The map of the world is not a journey. Someone returned could only describe the web of gravity holding the earth in place. Oh. This poem is about something I saw that brought back a lot of memories. I saw a little girl running with a jump rope. In the empty parking lot behind the high school, a family has parked their van with the doors blown open. The father is thin, a biker or a runner with a long red beard from months of quarantine. The mother could be a runner too, skin tight leggings, not from fashion, the practice care of three young children perhaps a husband who wanders in a dreamlike state. I walk by, mask for the times, hidden smile remembering parking lots and bicycles, safe asphalt for practice and play. They ignore the man walking by. The oldest, a boy helmeted, fiercely pedals his bike. I can't remember what his sister was doing because the youngest, the little girl about three, old enough to run without falling, throws herself into delight of balance, captures my attention. She emerged from the van with a jump rope, a simple object, began to run, trailing the rope behind, twisting her neck around to see the plastic grip bounce up and down as she ran a smile splitting her face, her mother watching, feet planted apart, 
arms akimbo, back to me. I could not see if pride, delight, fatigue filled her eyes. My eyes were filled with memory and something like awe, a child running, taking a simple thing, ignoring its purpose, its design, transforming it into something not yet imagined, creating joy. And as mentioned, um, I studied with the poet David Ignatow in New York. In fact, uh, one of the poets that's here tonight, Amy Small McKinney, she and I met long ago, and she was the one who was studying with David and um, suggested that I come along. And it was a great experience. And this poem makes reference to a small poem of his um, that comes from his book, The Animal in the Bush. <clears throat> it's a short poem, I'll read it. I am asking for two lives and I have only been able to express the longing of this one, which is called writing the poem. Ignatow. He peered over his glasses, his face hovering above a bleached dinner of chicken and mashed potatoes. His gaze came from somewhere deep within. He would blink if I said soul. The spoon paused before his mouth when I answered his question what I did for a living. My son is schizophrenic before the food disappeared. We talked about illness how over many years doctors had no answers, no medicine that helped. Without revealing what his poetry revealed, I could tell the sadness, the mystery haunted him. I can't remember if it was this chance encounter at the deli or later in his workshop that he said, I learned from Williams to guard against a romantic view of life, against elevated language, trying to make a leap into something which didn't exist. Because you asked, I try to conjure him here, to walk beside me in this American landscape, reveal something in his observation I seem to be missing. I'm reluctant to pull him from that world where he is at peace. He's already revealed what I need to know. Happiness is overrated. Peace of mind is what I seek. It was great to study with him. <clears throat> mirror, mirror. I mourn for you, boy of wonder, of dreams. Do you still dream? In the mirror of the day, you were bright. Shadows cast aside, no one touched you. The night glass reflects back an image under street lamps, fleeting as he goes without sun, like a ghost, spotlight to spotlight. Here, now, I am repurposed, poor boy purified with a longing so dangerous, it could break a heart. So I hope the title um, of this next poem uh, refers to all of you. New Wisdom 2020. A comet has arrived, circled the sun, just left just being a relative term, probably just passing Mars, inadequate to describe the vastness of what we cannot fathom. I have only seen the comet in photographs, being both a modern man and quarantined. I'd like to think it touched me with its portents of doom, the contents of its misty tale, drifting like pestilence through the atmosphere. 
we never blame ourselves. From the photos and the explanations, I knew I could see it in the hour before dawn. The only reason I'm awake then is to pee. I looked out the bathroom window and the clouds had all disappeared. This could be the morning. Alas, from where I looked, I could only see the belt of Venus. It is a beautiful morning, cool for summer, birds singing songs to match the air, bright and clear. The half moon at the zenith moves at a pace I can watch, no disappearing ball of ice. I would have liked to see a comet from the comfort of my home, this suburban paradise of privilege and trees, birds that aren't pigeons, grass that's mostly green and mowed. I talk to the moon all the time. What would I say to a comet that would make it stop and listen? Parable of the Shovel Man. It comes to me in the night with its falling darkness, the things I have left undone, rising from the grave of sleep. I am not afraid, merely exhausted, life lingering on. Uh, there's an uplifting uh, little poem. <laughs> Okay. Hopefully this will put a smile on your face. <clears throat> Rags and dolls. Our daughter rips old shirts into rags at her mother's request. Busy work. You would never know this woman was a wild thing. Dance nights into days now poster mom of completed task, keeping mortality at bay, or the virus. It could be something more mundane, time to think or feel. We are using the pandemic to begin death cleaning the house, save the children from sorting through attic memories, stepping over a boundary there, since our daughter's childhood, she asked, oh no, what about the Barbies? <laughs> My daughters are laughing in the other room. <clears throat> the voice walking. My back is to the world, my eyes in a book, the window open to the sounds of autumn, a leaf touching others fallen, occasional cars ignoring the stop sign at the corner. It is quiet for late afternoon. A woman's voice arrives before her shadow, her shadow before her. It is a voice for this time of day, of year, of Time that is out of time, as quiet as wind that is gone. I can only imagine I am changing, pulled from my book back into the world by a voice walking through the neighborhood, talking to someone far away as if life could resume, but changed, less angry, less focused on insisting on a silence imposed from a life too important to be interrupted by the sound of a stranger's voice, so familiar it could be someone I used to love. It could be that voice. <clears throat> so this next poem is in memory of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. White Horse. Bill Moyers interviews Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She reveals she studied with Nabokov at Columbia, who said, 
I like to write in English because the adjective comes first. By the time the horse arrives, you already know it's white. I had tuned in hoping to hear her tell us what is wrong with America. Moyers gave away too much time to Pastor Jones, president of Union Theological, then to the man's wife, Judith Suzanne Davidson, which was wrong, revealing a lack of sophistication, surprising for the journalists who, though white, has always had a remarkable understanding of oppression, Columbia supporter, our own goddess of libertas. This intro is too long, confirm when Moyer said we have to stop. He never got to ask Ruth, what is wrong with our country? She ended saying she has hope in our youth, the first old person besides myself to say that which reveals a word that is wrong, snowflake. At Columbia Union or the Jewish seminary across the street, whether black, white, any skin tone imagined, race as color is so white, spoken by Caucasians. What was I waiting to hear from Ms. Ruth? Wrong goes a long way back. Columbia Ave, now Cecil B. Moore Boulevard in Philly erupts in riots in 64. Wrong was a way of life before I woke up. Our history reveals we never get it right. Wealth, its accumulation comes first. Jim Thorpe, Jackie Robinson, how would you like to be the first? How much fun could it be? the nation cheering, then jeering, little old you. Me, I was never that good, never shot or jailed from protest back row, wrong to assume that others are as free to express themselves equally. Columbia, blonde flapper, dressed to kill an old glory, original name of the colonies before we united against the Brits from whom we got English. Let us ride the white horse. And so this is my final poem. For tonight, I wanna to thank everybody again for coming. Great to see so many in the audience. It was a privilege to read with my old buddy, Liz Chang, a great poet. I want to thank Alina and Jen for hosting and the overarching host, um, Larry Robin. Uh, please support Moonstone. If, if you can, go to the website, Moonstone Arts Center. Uh, lots of books for sale and uh, need for contribution. Thanks again, Larry. And the title of this last poem, Post-Apocalyptic Wedding Poem for the Not Faint of Heart. This ain't your five and dime dollar store poem. It's gonna cost you more than two chickens and a goat the mighty Favag would extract for his wisdom. This is a cautionary tale, let us venture to remember. You can as easily fall out of love as the other way around. Without usual warnings, the asteroid from the unknown invades the orbit of your world. If you have loved and lost and love again, you have the calluses to play this tune. I've had a love like yours. Be brave. It is the thing that enables love to endure, enables love to end. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>